Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me here today for episode number 283. I'm excited today because I'll be sharing with you an interview I did with three guests, Dr. Fred Mararkey, Patty Burgess and Sheila Schultz, and we talk all about the Midio technology, which Dr. Mararki created for making video advanced directives. And I've interviewed Dr. Mararki twice in the past about Midio, and you'll find links to those two episodes in the show notes at eolupodcast.com. And at that same website, you'll find all the archives for this podcast going all the way back to episode number one. So if you're new to this podcast and you'd like to check out some of the previous episodes, just go to eolupodcast.com and you can scroll scroll through, you'll find a wealth of information there. I've done lots and lots of interviews over the years. So as I mentioned, in this interview, we'll be talking about advanced care planning, but a new innovation using video technology and also some certification training that's available to become an advanced care planning educator. And I wanted to tell you that right up front, stay tuned throughout the entire interview. And at the end, we'll be talking about how you could take part in this training if you'd like to become certified in using the Midio technology, which is something monetizable. So for those of you who are educators in your community already or working as end-of-life doulas, you might be interested in learning how to add another tool to your toolbox that you offer to the people you work with. So check out this interview. I think you'll enjoy learning more about Midio and how you too could become an advanced care planning educator. So I don't have any other announcements today. We'll get right into the interview and stay tuned afterwards, and I'll come back with just a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm so excited to welcome three guests to the podcast. I think this is the first time I've ever had three people on before, and I'm so excited for the conversation we're having about an exciting new innovation in advanced care planning. So I'll introduce, first of all, my three guests. Patty Burgess is the founder of Teaching Transitions and Doing Death Differently. Differently, a training organization for hospice volunteers, staff, and end-of-life doulas. She was one of seven original founders of NIDA, the National End-of-Life Doula Alliance, as well as a charter member of the NHPCO End-of-Life Doula Council. My second guest is Dr. Fred Mararki, who I've interviewed twice before for the podcast, Dr. Fred is the medical director of the UPMC Hammett Emergency Department in Erie, Pennsylvania, the principal investigator of the Triad Research Series, the Realistic Interpretation of Advanced Directives, and the founder of Midio, a video advanced directive and physician's medical order. And I'm also joined by Sheila Schultz. Sheila is a stress management and resiliency facilitator and an end-of-life doula who has partnered with Patty and Dr. Mararki to train doulas, advanced care planners, and other healthcare professionals using the Midio technology. Together, these three have launched Your Voice Directives, the training arm for Midio, and paved the way to collaborate on Midio University, the only organization to train and certify advanced care planning educators in every community using the Midio approach. And we're going to be talking all about that, Your Voice Directives and Midio University. And I'm really excited to share this information with my audience out there. If you want to learn more, you can go to the website, yourvoicedirectives.com. So Patty, Fred, and Sheila, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. To get started, Dr. Mararki, Fred, I thought I'd ask you to just tell us what Midio is. You and I have talked about it before in the past, but for listeners now who might not be familiar with it, would, would you start by telling us what is Midio and what led you to create it? Sure, absolutely. So first and foremost, I, I think of Midio as it, it's more of a life or death thing for, for me in my mind. 
and Sibby, for you and your mind, as far as people who look to do it, there's lots of stuff that's happened as far as how we document wishes. And that's a life or death decision when it comes to end of life care. Um, and, you know, through the triad research over time and years, we found out that essentially people don't really understand those kind of issues. So when people ask me what Medio is, I, I tell them Medio is something that's new. Uh, Medio is you because it's you speaking for yourself and it's the future. It's where we need to get to as far as people documenting wishes. And we don't want to settle for things like paper or just digitize paper because really that's nothing more than a guess. It's a scientific guess, hopefully, by a medical provider who's taking care of you at a time when you can't speak for yourself. So Medio came and it's been birthed from uh, the triad research which essentially was our big study, the Triad 8 study, that essentially looked at scripted video and how we can bring scripted video into a clinical scenario. So, and that's what we've been able to do with this now. We're able to bring you into a clinical scenario with a medical stranger, a medical provider who doesn't even know you, and now you can tell them exactly what you want. And it's become this nice little cool video advanced directive, and we've been able to create it into medical orders as well when it's created by physicians. There are, there are so many things I really love about this idea. One is the fact that the patient records themselves speaking what their wishes are. And I think about that in terms of being a family member, a loved one who's able to watch that video in, in a moment of crisis and actually hear their own loved one saying, this is what I want. But then also that because you help script the the what's being said, the words that are being said, it speaks directly to the medical providers making decisions. So the person recording, if I understand correctly, is using the language that doctors and nurses in the emergency room will understand and immediately know how to respond. Is that correct? That it's correct. And, and that's what we've really tried to create here. We tried to create something that was clear you know, in, in how it could be done and communicated, comforting and, and produce the clarity needed in a document so that the family member feels appropriate, the medical team feels appropriate, that everyone's providing the right care at the right time. And I just want to emphasize that this isn't something that like any one of us, I could, you know, I could do a self video on my phone and <laughs> talk about what I want or don't want. But this is, is totally different because of the education that you're providing to, to the people who are creating their advanced directive. That's very important. So we call that scripted versus non-scripted. Non-scripted video is basically you doing a selfie that just says something vague. That's no more safer than the paper document that we have to guess upon because now we have to guess upon your wish. What we do with scripted video is we detail how you want treated. You identify yourself, you know, according to Joint Commission identifiers. You basically tell people how you want treated in an emergency. You then clarify, you know, who's to make decisions for you and what potential triggers could be for any legal documentation you have or medical orders you then have. And most importantly, who to call. You know, you need to have someone call and sometimes clarify the situation. And we've been able to package all that in a way that's useful now for the med medical providers. So the patients feel comfortable expressing it and the medical providers feel comfortable receiving it. And again, the goal here is right care at the right time. It doesn't matter if a patient wants to live or die. The most important thing is the right care at the right time for that particular patient. And could you explain how would the medical staff access the video, video if a patient is brought into the emergency room? Sure, be happy to. So Today, we use ID cards and medallions, and we pretty much use uh, ID cards because they're very easy, they're cheap to do, and they're very portable, right? No people, nobody really likes to carry their living will with them or their pulse document with them, but they will carry an ID card because they're used to carrying driver's licenses and insurance cards and so on. In fact, that's where we tell people to keep them, right by their driver's license and insurance card. And what happens is we've trained our patients that go through and we've trained the AC piece to educate our patients that go through that we want them to announce they have it when they enter an interaction that's medical. When they get asked the question, hey, do you have a living will? Or hey, do you have, or um, how would you want treated in cardiac arrest? Those are two Trump, two prompts that we essentially trigger the patient to then show the ID card. 
And the ID card has a QR code on it and it has scripted information on the ID card itself so that people can actually make immediate decisions. But when they need clarification, they can use any kind of a smart device to scan that QR code, which will in 10 seconds or less bring up that video of that patient to that medical provider clarifying exactly what they want rather than that medical provider standing there making a guess. Yeah, so 10 seconds or less, that's that's really quick and that's very accessible and comparable to somebody probably carrying in their living will in their hand. I mean, being able to access that video and then getting much better, much clearer information from the video than might be on the written paper. Next, I'd like to ask Sheila. I know that Sheila, in your story, you um, were a stress management and resiliency facilitator, and then you met Patty. And uh, I wanted wanted to know a little bit about the story of how you and Patty started to work together before you got involved with Dr. Fred and and uh, Midio. Sure, sure. Well. It turns out Patty and I both have extensive experience in healthcare marketing and education. I ended up going down the realm of uh, stress management, uh, grief recovery. So I started a business several years ago and I ended up uh, meeting a gentleman who was a cancer survivor and we started an online show. Uh, We ended up interviewing Patty Burgess one time. And so we were hosting the show, Patty was our guest. And the name of the show was Finding My New Normal. So we were trying to bring in different guests to talk about um, cancer survivors and what what life looks like. And a big part of that is the discussion about death and dying. And that's where Patty came in. So we interviewed her as an expert in hospice work and in death work. And we just kind of clicked. We started working together right after that. I ended up getting a certification as an end-of-life doula. Um, I have to say that we're different kinds of people. We do have a lot of similarities, but Patty tends to be a bigger picture, visionary kind of person. I'm more of a connector of people and systems and I integrate things. So uh, it was just kind of a natural fit. We work well together and I'm just uh, so excited that now we're together in your voice directives. So it sounds like it was in the stars for the two of you to come together. Um, but then, Patty, why don't, you, why don't you carry on with the story and talk about how the two of you started to work with Dr. Meraki and what, what compelled you to want to know more about Medio and, and to work with him on this Medio project? Sure, sure. Well, as uh, Sheila and I started working together and we... Uh, kept thinking about these different ways uh, in which we could um, engage doulas more fully in their community. Um, uh, As you know, that uh, I work on the hospice side, training volunteers and and staff, uh, as well as end-of-life doulas. And what I recognized on the doula side, as we've been seeing this emerging profession continue to grow. And and it's exciting. I would say it's probably in its um, toddlerhood right now. It's past its infancy because we're really starting to see um, a lot of articles, a lot of information, and um, not that it's mainstream yet, but in, in being able to sort of professionalize and legitimize and actually monetize those doulas who were looking to do this kind of work that is uh, grief work or death and dying, um, accompanying the dying, looking to do that as a living, it's been harder, I think, for doulas to go out there and, and do this because it's not mainstream yet. There are no real jobs yet. So my interest was trying to find ways to connect doulas to um you know, possibilities of income streams or uh, starting businesses, um, kind of wholehearted entrepreneurship um, when it came to um, the doula side of things. And so part of what we also recognized is that as much as, gosh, I feel like volunteers are heroes, you know, that's the kind of um, hours that get offered out there um, you know, after we're, we're done taking care of our families and all of the things, all the stuff of life. And we know that that's not where people die or, you know, find themselves in need. So that's why when 
uh, I found Dr. Meraki. And by the way, Dr. Meraki, I was looking for you, didn't even know you existed, but I was looking for you or someone like you for a couple of years before we put this together. So um, basically what I was researching was how advanced care planning, we knew that Medicare um, was now reimbursing physicians and um, qualified non-physician providers to have this important conversation. But we also knew that doctors were busy, um, that perhaps um, it didn't you know, pay well enough for the time they were able or willing to spend. So there were so many things in there that I thought, well, could a doula be plugged into these advanced care planning conversations? How would that work? And could we connect them with providers who were doing this? And so um, I went back out to Google, as we all do, to, to look for things. And one day I found Dr. Meraki and Midio, and I could not believe it. And I will tell you, the, the enthusiasm has never waned. I don't even think I was done reading your website, Dr. Meraki, um, before I got an email off to you to say, hey, you know, we may have something here. We may have a distribution system that is a way for doulas to bring people into advanced care planning in a way that um, was, you know, with greater ease than the arm twisting many people go to advanced care planning now. Um, and how could we find a revenue stream to um, take care of these doulas who were looking to do this beautiful work in the community for a living? And that's kind of how that happened. And then we found we uh, organized a, a pilot program of about 70 people to go through. And it's been amazing ever since. Yeah. And I was just a couple of things I wanted to say is that I feel the excitement of it's this new burgeoning career for end of life doulas that's unfolding all around us. And yet it's at this really challenging phase, as you said, because it's not mainstream yet and and wanting to really encourage people to take up this work. And there are so many people out there, I think, who are being called to it as well. And yet the challenge of not being able to monetize the work or get paid for it has been really frustrating. So I can see why you were, were so excited to hear about this possible opportunity with Midio, but also because being in advanced care planning education is a perfect fit, I believe, for end-of-life doulas. They're already comfortable talking with people at, at the end of life and helping families and patients make decisions and choices for themselves. So to me, it, it, it seems like it couldn't be a better fit. Uh, absolutely, Karen. It, it, and I saw all of that before I even had the conversation. Marky didn't know if that was going to work. But just as you said, to be able to connect doulas with the community, with these advanced care planning conversations, the, the, the fit was really perfect, but wanted to find a way that um, people could look at, you know, is there a possibility for me to do this for my, um, for my paid work? And, it, and um, we were able to set that up with uh, uh, Dr. Meraki and um, the rest is history so far. And so, um, Dr. Fred, it seems like uh, this was a perfect fit from your perspective as well, from Midio's perspective, to be able to partner and work with end-of-life doulas, but also other people interested in advanced care planning education. Absolutely. You know, the, the work they do is pretty impressive. It's pretty important. Um, and, you know, we, we, we know this is a tough subject for people. So we, we essentially wanted to try and put something together where we can guide people through a process, non-biasedly guiding people through a process. You know, I think a lot of what has happened in, you know, advanced care planning has been dubbed end-of-life care planning. So we've, we've essentially got people maybe leading people in a direction that aren't ready or appropriate to be led in a direction. And that's where I found a lot of enjoyment with the doulas in that you know, we had to refocus a good bit of them to realize that these documents are not just about end, right? You know, you can have these documents when you're in wellness, you can have these documents or medical orders when you're in some degree of serious illness, and then at the end. And I could not tell you how many people that initially that I saw, you know, early on in the pilot here, 
um, who had the wrong types of medical orders. You know, they had a pulse form that said DNR CMO on it. Or the first thing they said to me was, I'm a DNR. You're not going to change my mind. And these are young, healthy people walking through the community. You know, so it's been really enjoyable to kind of see the transformation in the mindset and how you can empower them now. Because now they can go and actually talk to people who are just really doing a better form of estate planning, you know, because they just didn't want a living will. They wanted something more, more structured or, or more safe that they felt they needed. Um, and then they can also have those other forms of conversations when people are at serious illness and then they've already done a great job at the end. So that was just a double bonus, quite frankly, you know, because they're very comfortable with end of life patients and are involved in hospice. So, but the whole approach has been very enjoyable. And this is such a good point you're making because in the advanced care planning world, we're encouraging people as soon as they turn 18 to have some form of planning, at least in terms of um, a, a healthcare proxy chosen for them for the future. And so you're right. If advanced care planning focuses only on end of life, we're missing a huge swath of the, the population that really should be starting this planning much, much earlier in life when they are younger and healthier. Yep, I agree. Because, you know, the whole thing, it's a living cycle, right? You know, again, wellness, illness, end of life. And, you know, the, the earlier you go, and, you know, I, this is probably just my opinion for now until it gets proven in research, but when you actively manage these people, that's where you help them transition. You know, you actively manage them in wellness, you follow them, you see them when they get diagnosed with that serious illness, you see them, you manage them, you follow them, you can help them transition to end of life. End of life doesn't have to be this drastic part at the end, you know, that, that people are so fearful of. It could actually happen, the, the whole planning aspect of it can happen early on in wellness, and that way people just just transition timely like they're supposed to transition rather than being forced into it right at the end. And uh, because we're recording this in um, January of 2021, and we're right in the middle of the COVID pandemic, Dr. Fred, I was wondering how is Midio, um, how might it be useful during this time, during this pandemic? And have you made any special changes to the script on Midio because of COVID? So yes, all around, you know, it, with COVID, you know, we've had to do some really, really drastic measures, right? You know, we've had to lock down hospitals, we've had to lock down skilled nursing facilities, post acute facilities, you know, you can't visit in the hospital with your family member coming in for surgery or so on, you know, or you may have one person, that person can only be there for a short period of time. So now you have a bunch of medical strangers, right? Because medicine is broken. Nobody's coming to the hospital that saw you as an outpatient anymore. At least very few people do. So now you have medical strangers taking care of these really sick and vulnerable patients who really at that point in time may have nothing more than a vague piece of paper, you know, to help that medical provider make a decision. And we already know that medical providers misinterpret those papers. You know, they misinterpret living wills as do not resuscitate orders. They misinterpret do not resuscitate orders as end of life care. So you're seemingly going into the hospital thinking you're receiving care and you're really being put behind the eight ball, so to speak, because you have people just not prepared to handle those kind of documents in this type of a stressful environment. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the whole aspect of unilateral do not resuscitate orders and, and systems feeling like they can impose a do not resuscitate order on you if they don't feel your condition is going to improve. You know, video can be very useful in all these types of situations with COVID because it can help those medical providers understand the patient's wishes better. It can make family members feel much more comfortable that they're going into a hospital with some sort of direction as far as not going in with just a piece of paper. You know, so COVID's really kind of opened open a lot of people's eyes. Now, as far as changing the scripts, absolutely. We've, we've had patients literally come in who are healthy and say they were told to add in their living will never to go on a ventilator. And that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we know, patient, we know patients who are not going to do well on ventilators. And I can tell you most of the healthy population who go on a ventilator are not a group of, of the population. For the most part, they're not going to go on a ventilator, you know, the younger population. 
and and to make a, a document to say they are not accepting of some sort of life-saving intervention starts a whole cascade of misunderstandings of medical providers thinking, well, if they don't want a ventilator, why would we do this other intervention when that's not really the intention? You know, or we had people that you know said save a young person first versus then versus saving my life with, with their documentation. So with video, we've been able to clarify, you know patients intentions as far as COVID a lot more scriptive than what's been done in paper documents. And so I just wondered, would you counsel a patient then in this time of COVID to maybe say, uh, if I'm brain dead and I don't, and I have very little chance of recovery, I don't want to be on a ventilator. However, in other situations, if it would help me, I'd like to be on a ventilator. Do you, do you counsel them to say something like that? So yes and no, just depending, you know, there, there are patients that we know that are high risk that we've been able to put into their script saying that if they got COVID, they realize they're super high risk and might not come off the ventilator. Um, and that in that instance, they would not want to go on a ventilator. We have others that essentially we, we are able to script out to make sure they at least get a chance of a ventilator for a period of time, but not proceed past the ventilator. Like when, when patients essentially are not doing well and then would need to go to some other form of intervention, ECMO, whatever the next portion is, some patients have actually opted to put stops prior to moving forward. So if they're not doing well in a ventilator for two weeks, then to essentially talk about the escalation of care. Mm. And what this points out is how essential it is to have a guide who helps you create the, the patient, create the script, because it's individualized. It's different for every person and it depends on their health history and their wishes. I couldn't imagine a patient alone, you know, trying to have to navigate those kind of decisions right now. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult for providers to have to navigate those decisions, you know, yet alone a patient who's got no medical knowledge at all. So again, it's been rewarding to see how we can customize scripts for patients in a time of a pandemic like this, so that we can make sure we can look at a patient, do an evaluation, look at their risk factors and see, see who may or may not benefit from a ventilator and then have it scripted appropriately for them. Mm. Yes. Wow. It's perfect. It's, I mean, Midio couldn't have come on the scene a moment too soon for you know, to be here as a tool for, for right now when we really need it. And Sheila, I was wanted to ask you from your background as a stress management and resiliency facilitator, um, how do you look at this work and Midio in particular and why it's important for, for people and communities to pursue? Well, wow. You know, Dr. Markey's words just really hit home with me today as I'm, as I'm listening to him talk. I lost my mom this year and imagine the frustration of me in the work that I do and the skills and ability I have to calm her and calm people around her, as well as being an end of life doula, not being able to be with her. It was extremely tough. And that's speaking from someone who knows how to cope with things that are tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as, as Dr. Moraki said, it is, I can't imagine. And and also knowing that there is an option out there that that Midio is available for so many people who are in this situation. It's just, you know, it's sort of bittersweet. It's kind of heartbreaking, but yet so exciting about the future because I know this is going to change so many people's lives. A lot of my work in stress management and resiliency is with families as they're trying to cope with the gravely ill or dying family member. And so when Midio came around and Patty and I went and got our, our Midio advanced directives done, I could not believe the difference in how I felt. I mean, I had my, my advanced directives done, but I just didn't know all these little details. And honestly, like so many other people, I thought of it as an end of life thing. When I was preparing it, I'm imagining myself at 80 years old, having a certain treatment, um, you know, having my wishes met. But I didn't, I never thought of, oh yeah, what happens if I'm in a car accident tomorrow? What happens if I'm injured? So the amount of stress that can be reduced by 
having this done and knowing that it's it's in your voice and it's in words that medical personnel understand and that families can't debate about is just such an amazing thing for me. This is such, such an exciting time. And you might feel like I do as, as a loved one to be able to, to see your person in the video and hear their voice and hear them telling you as well as the medical profession what they want and prefer, that just seems beautiful to me. It seems like it takes such a load off the family members who can finally feel reassured. I know, I know now what my mother wants and there isn't a question about it. And I know it from her. She's telling me herself. I, I just think that's, that's beautiful. It, it really is. And I have to say, I've also been called into a lot of family meetings where people have had to make a decision where someone has their advanced directives completed, but the family is still confused and the medical community is still confused. And they're all trying to get together to decide what that person really meant. So this is just a godsend. It's an amazing thing. So, and you yourself are an end of life doula. So I imagine that you're, you're feeling what we've been talking about, the perfect fit here um, for doulas in doula work to also be ad- medio educators or advanced care planning educators. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Although, you know, I think it fits with so many healthcare professionals, you know, anybody who's that heart centered, you know, person who wants to help people, it, it could fit in so many realms, but absolutely in the end of life doula world. Well, um, this is, it's just, it's really exciting to hear about it. And, and I wanted to, one thing I, I wanted to um, clarify, because I, I think this is the case, and maybe Sheila, you can answer this, that the right now during COVID, because it's really hard to have face-to-face meetings, is it possible to create these, these videos through uh, virtual meetings with patients? Yeah, there's, you know, a lot of doors have been opened because of the pandemic and some some rules have been lessened for telemedicine. And I know Dr. Maraki can speak a little bit more to the specifics, but absolutely that video is available. A lot of uh, healthcare um, appointments are now available on video and it just makes it easier to to get these in the hands of more people, which is very exciting. Exactly. So anyone who gets this training is not limited to the people in their own community necessarily, but they could be reaching out to people at at greater distance virtually to help them with their planning. Oh, yeah. We see this happening across the country and across the globe. Wow. That's really exciting. Well, Patty, I wanted to ask you, I know that you have, the three of you have collaborated together to create Midio University. And I was hoping you'd tell us more about that. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, Midio University was really born out of this pilot program where I mentioned that we had um, nearly 70 uh, doulas, advanced care planners, patient advocates, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, all sorts of um, medical and non-medical uh, folks come together and learn um, a lot of the things that Dr. Markey is talking about today to learn about it, to uh, learn how to um, uh, basically talk to somebody about Midio, to um, educate more about the um, problems that Dr. Markey already talked about when it comes to uh, traditional advanced care planning and how to facilitate somebody through the process. So um, all of that, which was about a 10 week program for this pilot where we learned a lot and um, really kind of uh, honed in on the education that we wanted to provide. And of course that will always keep um, changing and morphing and growing. And so out of that came Midio University. So um, what's exciting is that Midio University is opening its doors for our first class after the pilot uh, in mid-February. And we do have um, two webinars coming up, uh, actually this coming Wednesday and the following Wednesday uh, for people if they're interested in finding out more about it. And um, 
uh, it's going to also be a, a, a 10 week course. And the idea is that um, not only do we want to help people understand uh, that, you know, so many things we've been talking about on this webinar today, the ease in which you can get your um, advanced correct uh, uh, directive done, the fact that it is, um, you know, not for end of life, which, um, as you can imagine, uh, you know, a good portion of the pilot were end of life doulas. And <laughs> Dr. Markey, you were talking about, um, you know, all of these folks who were very comfortable with death, but recognized now, I think that, you know, none of us really talked about what Sheila mentioned, which was, um, you know, emergency care. What if we needed that? So all of that um, kind of training and uh, additionally, some basic, um, you know, business training, how to attract and talk to people about this and um, how we can um, begin to create in our communities these opportunities for people to have the conversation, open up the dialogue, and really uh, this whole thing focuses if we were to bring it down to, um, you know, kind of our tagline, that would be peace of mind and no regrets. Mm -hmm. And how can we create um, a life and a living we love for those people in the community who want to do that work? And that's what Midio University is all about. I know um, Sheila and I have been working closely together on the content for that. Sheila, maybe you've got some other thoughts about what's actually, um, want to share some other thoughts about what's actually going into the, um, the coursework uh, as well. Sure. You know, as, as Patty mentioned, it's introducing us, introducing what uh, is a lot of what's happening in this podcast here today, who we are, where we came from, how we are working with Dr. Meraki. But it's also about the advanced care planning landscape and sort of the good, the bad and the ugly of, of how things are working right now. Uh, we go very deep into the video process. We get them very well educated on how everything works, how they educate patients, walk them through the process, follow up after their video appointment. Um, and then, as Patty mentioned, an awful lot about business, which a lot of end of life doulas don't have um, experience in you know, how to approach people, how to engage, how to follow through with them. So it's it's a Business in a box meets a uh, very close touch, personal, you know, heart-centered doula work. So um, it's a very deep, <coughs> excuse me. It's a very com comprehensive program and it go we dive deep into a lot of topics and we're really looking forward to the launch. And so it's 10 weeks long. Is that meeting just once a week or, and how long are this, are, is each session? Well, oh, go oh, ahead, Patty. Oh, okay. Um, well, it's 10 weeks long because there are 10 modules and starting out, we're wanting to, you know, really dive into uh, each module and make sure that everybody has a clear understanding and really kind of gets the teaching into their bones you know, it's, it's funny because when Sheila and I first started this, we were really kind of studying with Dr. Meraki for almost a year, um, including the, the pilot time. And what we recognized is that um, what Dr. Meraki has put together is so uh, beautifully easy, simple, but there are some great nuances underneath and for, for um, anyone who wants to do this work to help people do it. And that's kind of the thing that we wanted to kind of have more of an immersive experience about to make sure people really felt um, comfortable and, um, you know, uh, s s we're able to bring people along so that um, anybody that they were talking to about having their advanced directives done felt like that it was going to be an easy process compared to, you know, what it's like right now, which seems kind of like the, the wild, wild west, I guess, a little bit, you could say. So um, those 10 modules, 10 weeks, but we're also going to have um, lots of ongoing support, Q&A, office hour sessions. Um, really what we do is train, coach, and mentor so that we can really populate uh, advanced care planning educators or ACPEs, as we call them, 
uh, in every community across the globe. And that's not just the U.S. either, because from what I understand, people do die or get in accidents in other countries. So we want to make sure that the globe really knows about this. And we've already um, opened up Australia as one of the other countries, um, looking at UK and uh, Canada as well. So um, this is not just a US thing. We, we really want to make this a global experience. And then I just wanted to clarify, because Patty, you were saying advanced care planning educators can be paid through the, I mean, Medicare now has codes to pay people for doing this training, but how how does that happen? Can you talk about how, how people who go through the program, how do they end up getting paid? Do they have to bill Medicare themselves? Well, actually, no. Um, and it's two different ways. Um, there's a couple of different ways, but two in, in particular. So um, if people are working with Dr. Meraki's office, the Institute for uh, on Healthcare Directives, um, what, when they're going and taking, when they're taking a um, somebody, a, a patient or a client through the process, we've negotiated an arrangement with uh, Midio for that uh, particular ACPE or facilitator to get paid to do that, to take somebody through. So um, when we're talking about uh, ACPEs or uh, doulas or anybody doing this work in the community, there's also an opportunity to work with physicians or say nurse practitioners in their community who are doing the billing themselves. And in that way, uh, we train the ACPEs or the people going through our program how to work with physicians and the billing that they're going to be doing to create um, not only an income stream, but patients in that particular practice going through the MIDEO process. So uh, in the training, we talk about all the different ways that uh, an ACPE can get paid and all the different roles that they can play so that uh, depending upon what a particular ACPE is drawn to, whether it's working with a physician in their community, whether it's working through telehealth, whether it's sitting on the couch next to somebody when we can do that, um, there are all different ways in which to um, uh, bring video to their community, and they get to decide that based on what we'll be sharing in the training. And I wanted to say, I feel like this, um, this ability to monetize doing this work really contributes significantly towards sustainability. And it's, it's kind of what has been lacking in a lot of our innovations around end of life, a lot of our initiatives wanting to improve end of life care, we haven't been able to, to really monetize, which has made it much harder to get this movement started. So it's really exciting to know that built into this is the opportunity to actually get paid for the work that's being done. It's so great that you that you say that, Karen, um, and that you bring that up, because, you know, even within the doula community itself, there is sometimes uh, a couple of different camps as to those who believe that uh, doulas should be paid and some who feel that they should be volunteer. And what we really feel is that that's something that really comes down to, you know, the heart of that particular doula or um, ACPE in this case. And that is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, if we're only offering volunteer hours, not everybody um, is going to have a need on those particular hours. But when we can monetize uh, and find ways for people to you know, really create a living and life that they love, then we can serve so many more people. And I think that's really the goal is serving as many people as possible. And um, these days, uh, I think that's even more important. So I'm always been in the camp of, um, you know, we look at everybody else in the end of life industry, whatever service is out there and everybody is paid, especially since doulas, um, are what we would, you know, I, I would say that they're they're folks who um, really take care of those time and service limitations. There's so many gaps in end of life care and even moving back up to palliative and just traditional medical care. And when we can bring people in to um, really better the patient experience, 
that to me seems like something that um, we should all feel good about compensating. Yes, definitely, definitely. This, it's just this is a really exciting development and has so much hope for the future for actually making significant changes. And I wanted to say, um, I'll go back to Dr. Fred, I just wanted to thank you because you have actually pointed out to me because I've worked in hospice for much of my career. And Patty might echo this same, same thing that many of us are end of life biased, I think, you know, our really our vision and our focus is all about how do we help people die better. But in fact, advanced care planning helps everyone live better and uh, before they reach the end of life. And so, I mean, you've helped me realize that I myself have kind of had blinders on and have focused on uh, advanced care planning is all about those last days of life. So I wanted you to just restate it, Dr. Fred, like about the importance of this, this certification of educators and how you see how you see advanced care planning education serving communities. Sure. And as we're talking, literally, Paul Bond from the New York Times just releases an article and says, filing a lawsuit for wrongful life. You write your advanced directive. You tell your healthcare proxy what you want at the end of life. And in a hospital, the staff and doctors pay no attention. Can you sue? Can you win? So literally, that that has been a lot of the information that has been propagated out there as far as end of life care and so on, or the documents as they relate to end of life care. So a couple of things, like th this is a really important point in that, you know, we now have two types of lawsuits that are happening. We have wrongful death, meaning we misinterpreted a living will as a DNR for a patient who should have been treated and we let that person die or we have wrongful prolongation of life now where we take someone's living will or someone's pulse document and we, we, we toss it aside and we provide care thinking we're not going to cause harm. Well, the law, the, the courts don't follow that action anymore. The courts actually are favoring on the side of the, the families who were suing because their mom or dad's life was saved. So the intention here is to bring balance into the community, into the world, as far as advanced care planning. And that's why the university was formed, so that we can empower people, we can train appropriate educators to be balanced in their, their discussions with patients, so that we can teach and teach medical staffs and medical communities and providers, as well as patients. Again, it's about the right care at the right time. Just because you have a document doesn't mean you're ready to die. Just because you have a document doesn't mean you um, um, want to be a D, want to have a DNR order. If you have a DNR order, we should basically be taking the time to clarify that do not resuscitate order with you. We should be taking the time to clarify to make sure we're not over treating a patient who's got an existing do not resuscitate order. And today, outside of paper, I don't know how you do that well. And that's why video has become so, so important here. Because now, again, through video, we can clearly emphasize the patient's direction and course because it's appropriate for that particular patient. You know, and I think that's the most important thing here in what we're creating in this university and trying to certify advanced care planning educators that we, we need them to be more facile and we need them to be more understanding of the issues because everyone doesn't fit into one box, into one check checkbox. And we got to do better at customizing care for patients so that we cannot over treat the patient who wants to die and not under treat the patient who wants to live. And that's just so perfect. And you'll remember, I think it was in our first interview together, Fred, I told you my story of being admitted to the hospital overnight after I got a concussion in a bike accident. And the admitting nurse going down the checklist said, do you have a living will? And I said, yes. So she checked the box off. And a few minutes later, came back with a sign she posted on the door to my room that said, do not resuscitate. <laughs> and I was, I was so upset. I said, don't you know the only reason I'm here? Because of my 
closed head injury is so that you can resuscitate me quickly if something should happen. Like I don't, I want to be resuscitated. And, and it was a perfect illustration of what you're talking about. The misunderstandings and the lack of communication and lack of clarity. So we, we recently just published a study called the triad simulation study. And it'll be embraced into the university as far as what we, what, how we train and teach and so on. And the, the scenarios were so impressive to see providers become paralyzed by the documents, not knowing what to do when a patient was having a critical event or just assuming the patient was a DNR or just disrespecting the patient's document and overtreating the patient. It's all over the place. And to make an impact here, you have to get disruptive with a few things. You gotta change what the existing education is because it's clearly not working. You have to change how we document and it's clearly not working. And you gotta change how we basically inform and communicate to the medical providers because the existing things are not working. So if we can get disruptive in those few areas and build the right programs of education, the right programs of technology, the right programs of, of safety, then I think we can impact care and treatment to prevent these types of medical errors. And that's what they are, right? You know, it's, it's no different than giving someone who's allergic to aspirin an aspirin. This is a medical error. When we misinterpret a document and undertreat or overtreat, it's a medical error. And now, again, the court systems are basically reinforcing that these are errors because they're finding in favor of the families. And I wanted to add to that, too, um, Fred, as I see some of my colleagues in primary care are, are beginning to wake up to the idea that they should be asking their patients about their ad advanced care planning and their wishes, but they're still finding huge obstacles in terms of just not having the time, not having enough training, not knowing when or how to introduce it. And I think that's another reason why advanced care planning educators can be can really take the load off of those very busy doctors who wish they could wish they could have conversations with their patients, but just may not be finding a way to do it. Oh yeah. I mean, primary care, I mean, they're, they're strapped for time. I mean, there's a lot to get done in a Medicare wellness visit. You know, the last thing they have time for, or the last thing the patient wants at that particular point in time is to then sit down and, and have an end of life conversation or advanced care planning conversation, you know, so primary care providers, I, I really do feel for them. And this is, I'm, I'm hoping what comes of this university or partnerships with primary care providers so that doulas can work with primary care providers and provide the education so that, you know, we can get better documentation of patients' wishes and that they can find this as a tool. It has to be um, viewed as a, use, a useful tool for providers for it ever to get really embraced. Yes, definitely. And, and I see a big future there. I realize there's a lot of education has to happen of doctors, but I, I see the potential for it there. Absolutely. I totally agree. So I wanted to, to emphasize, I think you were mentioning, um, Patty and Sheila, you have two webinars coming up um, on January 27th and February 3rd. And, and are those free webinars that people can tune in to learn more? Yes, uh, absolutely they are. Um, if they were to, if anyone's interested and you want to go to yourvoicedirectives.com, you'll see on the um, homepage that there is a kind of an opt-in to find out more. And if um, they would be so kind as to give us their contact details, then we will uh, get them out the information about the, <clears throat> excuse me, about the webinars. And of course, keep them on our correspondence list as long as they want to be for um, any new uh, happenings, um, you know, more information in the advanced care planning industry and to keep everybody informed. So we would love to, um, to invite people to come and join us. And then it'll be mid-February is when you're starting the first 10-week uh, class to, to, for new advanced care planning educators. Is that, is that right? Yes, absolutely. So we'll um, have the first webinar on the 27th to try, to try to basically introduce 
uh, Dr. Meraki, his work, um, again, the, the um, ACP landscape, why this is so important and needed. And then the second webinar, we'll talk a little bit more about Midia University and um, what they get and how they can enroll. And um, we'll get started probably, uh, as, as you said, mid-February. We, we just want to give people enough time to digest the information and um, make a decision if it's for them. All right. And um, let's see, I thought of, oh yeah, I had one more thing I wanted to mention. Patty is recently, oh, it was just a few weeks ago, I was part of an online conference and we were having a discussion with the group about advanced care planning. And someone who had attended your 10 week pilot program came on and she had, she was so excited and so enthusiastic about Midio and she had nothing but good things to say about your program. And so I wondered if you've had other positive feedback from people who were part of that pilot program. Oh, gosh, yes. And that's so exciting to hear. Um, just, you know, I mean, here we are in the middle of a virus, but it's nice to know that um, what we're doing is kind of going a little viral, or at least <laughs> heading out that way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, one of the things that um, we we have gotten so much feedback, um, and, you know, it's, it's varied, too, to your point earlier, Dr. Meraki's point about, you know, it, it, it is true, because we had um, what's the word, a preponderance. We had a lot of end-of-life doulas in the program who really were looking, you know, were end-of-life biased. And I think through this process began to see that balance that Dr. Meraki was is so interested in um, to make sure that, you know, we are really educated, which is why um, he has really certified the curriculum to make sure that um, you know, we're getting the right information out there. But when we hear that people are so interested, it's so great. We took a poll and, and um, you know, got people to weigh in and they told us um, all of the different reasons why they were excited, whether it was for them or the person that they facilitated, because that's part of the process. So if you go to our website at Your Voice Directives, you'll see um, a tab there that says praise. And we've got a lot of folks from the pilot on there talking about their particular experience with, with Midio. Um, and we, we've tended to use the line, but um, one of the, one of the um, participants there used the line jaw dropping. Uh, I guess, what did she say? Something about um, uh, showing Midio to um, patients and physicians has been a jaw dropping experience. And um, that's what we find. In fact, in fact, on that first webinar, we and, and people will get to do that on this webinar too coming up. We were able to put up a video card right on the screen, and people who attended could, or even on the replay, could put their smartphone over the QR code, and up came the video of this person that was uh, on the card. And it is jaw dropping when you see the the simple elegant yet profound possibilities with Midio. Um, and, and I might add that Sheila and I were so not interested in advanced care planning when we first, um, you know, got started as doulas. Uh, and to find that we have been so captured by the work and experience that Dr. Markey has done is, is amazing. And I know for him, it comes out of a lot of personal experiences as an emergency room um, doctor and also as a, um, uh, as you know, he's seen some families and loved ones go through some rough times where they could have used Midio. Mm -hmm. And it turns out <clears throat> advanced care planning is actually, it's kind of the missing piece in a lot of the work that many of us are trying to do, including helping patients and families live better and have more peace of mind and more and greater joy and love in their lives. Advanced care planning is actually a, a key part of that. So it's why all of us now need to become advocates for this kind for video and this kind of advanced care planning. Sure thing. I totally agree. Totally agree. It's turned us around and uh, not one moment since we've um, found, since we found video and Dr. Markey's work have, has our enthusiasm waned at all? 
Well, Patty and Sheila and Dr. Fred, I just want to thank you all three so much for coming on to tell us all about this exciting training that you have coming up. I believe there are a lot of people out there who will be interested in it. And this, this, this certification, because that's the other thing I wanted to ask, it sounds like people who complete the training will be certified as advanced care planning educators. Yes, and just so you know, that that is an internal certification because there is no advanced care planning certification body, just kind of like in the doula world. There are um, no, um, you know, there's not a certifying or accrediting uh, body. However, the certification process internally is such that it's been designed, um, you know, overseen and designed by um, Dr. Mararki and Sheila and myself. There are certain requirements um, to go through the program. Certainly, we uh, need to make sure that anyone who's who's uh, desiring to be an ACPE goes through their own video because we really don't believe if you're not gonna go through your own video that you can help facilitate another. Um, and also facilitation process plus successful um, uh, completion of the coursework. So a, a lot of different things have been put in place to make sure that it's not just anybody out there uh, who isn't familiar and doesn't understand the um, importance of the approach that video takes uh, is not just you know, going to be able to go out there and do it. They need to be certified to do it. And um, we're excited to be, you know, the first and the only um, organization to be able to offer this. And we've worked uh, in close um, uh, relationship with Dr. Maraki and his team to make sure that this happens in a way that he feels comfortable because we want to make sure that um, the message is clear and the messaging is consistent um, for what, for what he's uh, put together and for what MIDIA stands for. Well, before we go, I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Mararki and Sheila, is anything else that you'd like to add? Sheila, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I guess I'd just like to say that you know, Dr. Mararki mentioned that sometimes it's important to be a little bit of a disruptor. So you, you kind of have to disrupt the normal flow if the, if the normal standard way of doing things isn't working. And because I was never very much interested in advanced care planning, but now I'm so excited about changing it, <laughs> changing the future of it. I think that Patty and I both have in common that we're not afraid to cause a little bit of a ruckus if it means transforming uh, something that really could use some change. So um, we're, I'm just really excited about the future and very excited about not only our students and our graduates, but of all the clients and patients that they will serve. Karen, myself, I just want to say thanks. This is the third time you've had me on your, your podcast. You know, I appreciate each and every time you've asked me back. Um, it's, it's always fun. It's always engaging. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that this upcoming year is the year of Mideo and that we can get many healthcare systems and, and even the legal systems across the country to realize we got to do better than paper. And uh, I think you're going to help us do that. And we've got to do better than default mode. We have to get out of that in medicine. And so, well, Fred, it's been, it's been fun to uh, see the progress of Mideo over time because I've been able to observe that. And I'm really excited about where you are right now and launching this training. So I wish you all the best of luck. And I hope lots of listeners out there sign up and become an ACP educator. We are so appreciative, Karen. Thank you very much. You've got a, a voice that is um, respected in the community, and um, we're just very grateful. Thank you so much. Well, you're all very welcome, and so good luck. I can't wait till we can talk the next time when we can hear, hear about your next steps and how it's all has been going. So take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Fred 
Patty and Sheila. Uh, We had a great time chatting together about Midio and the possibilities that it offers us for the future. And I wanted to reemphasize something that I confessed to during the interview, which that I myself, when it comes to advanced care planning, have really been end of life centric, focused on end of life wishes for patients. And that comes from working in hospice, of course. But Dr. Mararki really informed me that this is not just an issue that needs to have an end of life lens. We really do need to look at the fact that people should have on video recorded somewhere their wishes so that no matter what age they are, no matter what state of health they are in, their family and their healthcare providers can access those wishes in a time of emergency or need. And that can happen at any time for any one of us, no matter what age we are. So this really gave me an opportunity to expand my view of advanced care planning and what it consists of. And as Dr. Mararki said, it's not just for dying, but it's for living as well. And I'm very excited about the Midio technology. I think this is a tremendous breakthrough that could potentially make a huge difference. And one thing I've learned throughout my years, not only of working in hospice, but all the years that I've been doing this, interviewing people from all over the country and even around the world, I've been convinced that advanced care planning is one of the keys to really improving health care in general, but particularly at the end of life. And even though it may not be the favorite topic for many of us to discuss, it's so important that all of us need to be behind it and need to be on the bandwagon of encouraging conversations about wishes for health care in a time of emergency and at the end of life. So I hope you'll give some thought to checking out Midio University, the webinars that are upcoming, and also the course if you'd like to become a certified advanced care planning educator which we need many of them all over the country in every community, really. So uh, give this give this some thought, and I hope that it is something that's of value to you. Remember, I'll be back next week with another episode of the podcast. I'm here every Monday with a, something brand new to share with you. So tune in as often as you can. If you haven't subscribed yet, go to Apple Podcasts, Google Uh, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you happen to listen to podcasts and sign up, become a subscriber and then leave a review if you enjoy this content and you'd like it to be shared with other people or share an episode or two yourself with someone you know who might benefit from this. Lastly, a third way you can support the podcast is become by becoming a patron on my page at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U. On that page, you'll find different tiers that you can sign up for for as little as $2 a month to help keep the podcast on the air. And I'm so grateful for all the people who've been making contributions every month for the past four years. Uh, It means everything to me. So thank you very much. Until next week, remember, we're here for love. That's all that really matters. So face your fear. Be ready for whatever might happen next and love each and every moment of your precious life. Bye-bye.